Hello, I'm Eric McCormack, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 2021 Canadian Journalism Awards. Coming to you the very same way we've been consuming our journalism all year, as a tiny box in a sea of multiple open windows. Daily life, as we know it, has become the least entertaining episode of Hollywood Squares. We spent the year wondering, is our camera on? Are we muted? Equally aggravating, wondering why the other person on the call has yet to figure out that the picture on the wall behind them is crooked. And are they doing it just to drive me nuts? It's not. It, it's supposed to be like that. Tonight, we hope will be different. Over the course of the next hour, we will introduce you to some brave new voices in the journalism community and celebrate some established ones. And we hope to present to you the picture of an industry whose brightest and most courageous continue to take us places others fear to tread. Places where we find such endangered species as facts and truth. Before we start the clock, we'd like to acknowledge our presenting sponsor for the evening, Scotiabank. Canadian Journalism Foundation values your support for their work in the pursuit and fostering of fact-based journalism. During these complex times, the news industry needs like-minded support and partnerships more than ever. To help celebrate the type of journalism we're recognizing tonight and to support the year-round work of the CJF, you can make a donation now by following the link below or you can find out more at any time at the CJF website. After securing the services of the star of a goofy American sitcom as host, the organizers of this event decided that there should also be a working journalist present. This for two reasons. Uh, one, you know, we're honoring excellence in journalism. It only makes sense that a journalistic peer should be involved in the celebration. That's, that's one. B, the organizers were concerned that there'd be a lot of big words used tonight. And well, there's a perception out there that some actors aren't very smart. I personally take uh, umbrage with that. In fact, it makes me positively acap... Ac apoplectic. But I'm Canadian, so I bury those feelings. It's my distinct privilege to welcome to our virtual stage as my slightly more credible co-host from CBC News Network, the trailblazing host of Canada Tonight, Janella Massa. Thanks, Eric. And even if I do know a few more big words than you, which actually I doubt, you certainly are the more experienced of us when it comes to awards. Eric is too humble to mention that he is an Emmy Award winner, a recipient of a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame and a star on Canada's Walk of Fame. He really is one of our greatest exports. And we... Oh, 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 Janella, please, you, you don't have to do that. It's, it's a little embarrassing. I mean... We're all Canadians here, and, and, and it's, uh, I don't think it's crucial that we, we throw around that kind of thing. Uh, although I will, I will, I will say, um, you didn't mention the, the Screen Actors Guild Award, and that's, you know, that was, that was a pretty exciting night for me. Also, the, um, the, the, the GLAAD Award was, that was kind of a big deal. Uh, but but a, a, anyway, anyway, journalism, back to you. I stand corrected. And belated congratulations, I guess. We'll start by acknowledging that we are on the land of the Mississaugas of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Wendat. We also recognize the enduring presence of all First Nations, Métis, and the Inuit peoples. Our first award of the evening recognizes a Canadian news organization whose journalism has had a profound impact on the community it serves. The CJF Jackman Award for Excellence in Journalism is named after Eric Jackman the founder of the CJF, a business leader and award-winning clinical psychologist. We're thrilled to have representatives from each of our five finalists here to join us and speak for their work. For its reporting on the controversial activities of the WE organization, congratulations to our first nominee, Canada Land. Representing Canada Land is editor-in-chief and publisher, Jesse Brown. Thank you. We are genuinely grateful for any acknowledgement from our industry peers. When Canada Land first investigated We Charity, we were met with legal threats, surveillance of our reporters and our families, 
and the PR campaign in which fake stories against us were planted in the press, including in Canadian news organizations, many of which had active partnerships with We Charity at the time. So yes, positive recognition from our peers is appreciated. Thank you, John Allen Namu, Jaron Kerr, Jonathan Goldsby, Andrea Schmidt, and Shannon Curry. This is what an independent news organization can do. The Narwhal is nominated for exposing transparency and accountability issues on the Site C Dam, the most expensive public project in BC's history. Joining us from the Narwhal, investigative reporter Sarah Cox. Thank you. I'm joining you from Victoria, from the ter territory of the Lekangwin speaking peoples. I'm very honored to be here. And first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the leadership of Emma Gilchrist and Carol Linnett at the Narwhal for carving out a vital space for investigations and public interest reporting. This work is so important when the public has access to information in a timely manner. It holds governments accountable and ultimately leads to much better decision making. Thank you to my fellow nominees for your wonderful, wonderful work. And thank you to the Canadian Journalism Foundation for supporting journalism across the country. Open Canada is nominated for Protected, a 15,000-word multimedia feature about Syrian refugees in Canada. Now a reporter with the Canadian Press, Man Almidi, speaks about his Open Canada piece. Well, thank you very much for this mission and this nomination. This story actually had, it took me two years to put it together. I had to travel to eight Canadian provinces to meet dozens of these Syrian refugees. I was able to listen and hear about their stories and their struggles and their successes in Canada in the last five years and put together a story that tells tells what what they, what kind of start, what, what kind of life experience they had and how they uh, experienced their 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 transition in their transition to to integrate in Canada. I would like to thank you for this uh, recognition and for this nomination and thank all the uh, my, my, my other nominees for, for their great work. For revealing how the RCMP secretly buys and uses powerful web surveillance tools while downplaying their capabilities, our next nominee is the TAI. Joining us now, reporter with the TAI, Brian Carney. Thanks so much for having me. And uh, yeah, my piece was uh, the result of a proof of information request uh, made to the RCMP that actually required a um, complaint to the information commissioner and all told it was over a year before we uh, obtained around uh, 3,000 pages of documents that um, led to a few stories and one of which is the one that was uh, considered here and I'm uh, very grateful to the TAI for sticking with me through the course of time that it took to uh, report that all out and uh, thanks so much for the attention to the reporting. The team at the Waterloo Region Record is nominated for its use of access to information requests to disclose details about Canada's last suspected Nazi war criminal, representing the Waterloo Region Record reporter Terry Pender. We would not be here um, were it not for Jim Poling, our editor-in-chief. He uh, greenlit this story uh, the first time he heard about it and his support remained steadfast uh, all the way through. My story built on the work of uh, many others uh, over two decades, most notably Jeff Outhit, another reporter at the paper. Uh, Neil Ballantyne did the copy editing, Sean Harrow did the fact checking, Kathy Wallace and John O'Han at the Toronto Star supported it and um, displayed it there. Um, I would not be here were it not for the work of all of these others and it's been a real pleasure. Uh, thanks for the nomination and good luck to uh, all the other nominees. And congratulations to all of our nominees. For what the jury noted was a vital body of reporting that not only exposed a cover-up, but also demonstrated how a lack of government transparency and accountability actually put the lives of its citizens at risk. The winner is the Narwhal. Congratulations. Janella, I, I know we're into the whole uh, journalism thing now, but um, you also didn't mention uh, the, the Golden Globes earlier. Uh, you know, I never won a globe, uh, despite being nominated time and, and time again. And I was a little bitter about that for many years. But now, as you know, just a few weeks ago, major studios uh, protested the Hollywood Foreign Press Association and, and, and Tom Cruise even gave back his Golden Globes. So now I'm thinking, maybe I can have one of his. 
You know, as an actor, I'm naturally good at, at segues. Ready? Speaking of globes, let's talk about our planet. Janella? Seamless transition, Eric. Well done. Yes, our next award is about our planet. Climate change is one of the defining issues of our time. Journalists play a critical role in providing accurate information to all of us about cause, effect, and possible solutions to this global crisis. And that's why the Canadian Journalism Foundation launched the new CJF Award for Climate Solutions Reporting. The award, which carries a $10,000 prize, celebrates a working journalist or team of journalists who shine light on these urgent issues for what the jury described as smart reporting that is engaging, textured, worrying, inspiring, and a high watermark for what climate journalism should be. The winner is What on Earth, CBC Radio. Laura Lynch, host. Joan Melanson, executive producer. Manusha Janakira, senior producer. Lisa Johnson, producer. Molly Segal, producer. Rachel Sanders, associate producer. And Matthias Wolfson, engineer. Hello from Vancouver and thank you so much for this recognition. We are a small but mighty team that puts this program together every week. And if we are providing information that inspires and interests and challenges people, then we're doing our job. But the fact is we couldn't do it without all of the people who have agreed to come on our program. And that includes indigenous leaders, scientists, politicians. They give so generously of their time and of their intellect needless to say, also their patience as we deal with the technical challenges that the pandemic has presented to us. Of course, the story of climate change is far from over and we are committed to continue telling those stories, not only of Canadians, but people all around the world who are fighting against climate change and of those who are being forced to learn to live with it. We are amazed at the passion of people about this subject. And I know because I hear from them every week in their emails, and we're grateful to the CBC for providing a platform for us to continue to allow Canadians to learn, to question, and to wonder just what on earth is going on. Thank you again from all of the team. Recognizing the need to amplify black voices, improve coverage of black issues, and cultivate future black media leaders, the foundation launched the new CJF Black Journalism Fellowship Program. The program provides unique opportunities for three early career black journalists to be hosted for six months at a CBC Radio Canada or CTV newsroom in Toronto. The program's three inaugural fellows will receive mentoring and training for a variety of skills that will provide the foundation for greater opportunities for black journalists and more racially diverse stories in Canada's major media. We believe in the power of story. We also believe that who tells the story matters. Here are this year's three recipients. The CJF CBC Radio Canada Black Journalism Fellowship goes to Tiffany Mboyo Mongu, a freelance associate producer with CBC Kitchener Waterloo. In her submission, Tiffany proposed exploring the lack of support in the healthcare system for Black Ontarians amid the pandemic and investigating the reasons why Black, Indigenous, and other women of colour are more vulnerable to face difficulties during childbirth. Here is Tiffany Mboyo Mongu. Hey everyone, this is Tiffany Mongu. I just want to say thank you to CJF for allowing me to be one of three recipients that will be attending the Black Fellowship Program in September. I want to thank the jury for making their decision, for choosing me to be a part of this program. I'm looking so forward to being a part of this wonderful and promising program and do really great things. The CJF CBC Radio Canada Black Women's Journalism Fellowship goes to Danielle Piper, a Vancouver-based freelance journalist. Danielle's story pitches included examining Vancouver's history with the Ku Klux Klan from the perspective of the black community and creating a data project profiling the ethnic, religious and lingual diversity of BC's black diaspora. My name is Danielle Piper, one of the recipients for the CJF's Black Journalism Fellowship Program. This program represents an opportunity to amplify Black voices and increase coverage of Black issues in Canada. And it's an honor to have been chosen for such a prestigious fellowship and to give remarks virtually for this event. With that said, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the jury members and the foundation for seeing my potential. And I look forward to starting the fellowship in September. The CJF CTV News Black Journalism Fellowship goes to Josie Fomey, a Montreal-based journalist. 
Josie's story pitches included exploring questions around intergenerational homes within black communities, especially during the pandemic, including how their experiences differ from those of smaller households. Josie also proposed exploring how young people are taking the lead in advocating for mental health in the black community. Congratulations to Josie Fomey. Is this thing on? Is this? Oh, hi there. If you're watching this, then we are still in a pandemic having virtual ceremonies, but nevertheless, we persist. My name is Josie Fomey, and I am so honored to be one of the recipients of the inaugural CJF Black Journalism Fellowship. I'll be joining the CTV newsroom, and I look forward to focusing on and amplifying stories within the Black community. Thank you so much to our sponsors who make this initiative and this opportunity possible, and thank you to the CJF. Congratulations to all three of our fellowship recipients. The way each of us gets our news has transformed more in the last few years than it has at any time in our history. Our next award highlights one of our industry's most pressing issues, the need for digital innovation to power journalism's future. The CJF Facebook Journalism Project Digital News Innovation Award recognizes that the media industry faces challenges on multiple fronts and that fresh creative thinking is essential. Now, in addition to selecting the winner of the $10,000 award, the jury was so impressed by the quality of the submissions that it wanted to recognize two organizations who deserve an honorable mention. Congratulations to the Canadian Press and Glacier Media Group. Now, for what the jury called its public-spirited desire to provide meaningful local journalism to Canadians, this Vancouver-based startup allows entrepreneurial journalists and community publishers to share the resources needed to launch, grow, and fill local news gaps. The winner of the CJF Facebook Journalism Project Digital News Innovation Award is IndieGraph. We are thrilled to be selected as the first recipient of the Canadian Journalism Foundation Facebook Journalism Project Digital News Innovation Award. When we started IndieGraph back in the beginning of 2020, we had no idea what the year had in store. We envisioned IndieGraph as a collaborative platform for independent journalists and community news publishers. Within weeks of founding our new company, a global pandemic was raging and 50 community news outlets had closed across Canada. And while this year has been hard in so many ways, it also presented a generational opportunity to rebuild community news to better serve communities. We're so inspired by all the committed journalists who struck out on their own this year to found their own independent media outlet. IndieGraph exists to help them reach their audience and grow to sustainability. So far, we've worked with 34 media projects across North America, led by journalist entrepreneurs. This award will help us build the movement of independent publishers serving communities and filling local news gaps. Thank you again to the Canadian Journalism Foundation for this honor. Is there anything more special than receiving an award with the words lifetime and achievement in the title? How about cherished and icon? Golden and globe wouldn't have killed them, but, but really, who, really, who wants that anymore? Anyway, not me. Not me. We did that bit. Now let us embark on the serious business of celebrating the career of a cherished icon of this industry. To tell us more about this year's Lifetime Achievement Award, here again is Janella. The Canadian Journalism Foundation's Lifetime Achievement Award has been presented annually to worthy individuals who have not only dedicated their careers to meeting journalism's highest standards, but have created a body of work that sets new standards. In this tradition of excellence, the 2021 CJF Lifetime Achievement Award recognizes a journalist who spent his life speaking the truth and creating a platform to amplify the truth. Tyre Denote Dan David's early career was highlighted by journalistic endeavors with broadcasters such as Vision TV, TV Ontario, South Africa Broadcasting Corporation and the CBC. In 2000, Dan was hired for his vast institutional knowledge to create an unprecedented new service in Canada a service that provided a voice and a platform for a people whose voices deserved to be heard. This is his story.
Siang. Thanks for joining us on Envision, our first news program here on APTN. We had very few resources, we had a very small team, but we had Dan's vision and Dan's passion for us. We, this group, this really tiny group of journalists just said, yeah, we're on, we're ready. We've been waiting for this opportunity for so long. Dan kept saying there are people out there who want to see us fail and we cannot fail. If we lose this opportunity, we won't get it again for generations. Dan is a really special person. He has a lot of gifts to share, and he certainly has been very generous in sharing those gifts. He really made us believe that what we were doing was important, that it was going to change the place of our people in Canada. It was gonna give a voice to people who didn't have a voice. It was gonna open up democracy in places where democracy wasn't working very well for us. He was able to put the principles of our stories by our people in place and get it moving, get us on the air, get us broadcasting, get us working. And that I think is his legacy. And I don't think that this organization could give this lifetime achievement award to anyone else. So Dan, from me to you, Congratulations. We shook the pillars of heaven because Dan let us know that we could and said, I will back you up every step of the way. Those days at APTN, some of the most incredible times in my professional life. And it was the capstone of my journalism career to be there. And I will forever thank you for that opportunity because it's it really changed my life for the better. An innovator, a trailblazer, a journalist. He's our lifetime achievement winner, Dan David. So there you go. That's hello in Mohawk. Uh, I want to thank the Canadian Journalism Foundation for this award. It's a huge honor, and I thank you very much. Niawa Goa. Uh, two questions popped up the moment I learned I got this award. My nephew wanted to know if this meant I was old. The other question was something that I had to find within myself by looking at those 40 years that I've been working in Canadian journalism to find a, a common thread. And I found three words that I think tell the story, changed the narrative. I think that's something that I've been working at from day one to today and probably till tomorrow as well. What was the narrative at the time? Well, they were based in bias and prejudice, stereotypes. Um, they basically said that indigenous peoples were either perpetual victims or perennial problems that just wouldn't go away. These were attitudes throughout Canadian society. And it's no wonder that a lot of those attitudes were in the Canadian media as well. Our job was to try to change those predominant narratives as journalists of color, whether you were black or brown or Asian or someone with a disability, it didn't matter. You had to try to break down those walls of apathy about who we were. We tried to get people out of their comfort zone to explore and answer the question, who are we? What are we? What are we doing? I had the great good luck of coming back from South Africa with some ideas about what we could or should do. And I lucked upon the Aboriginal People's Television Network they had just gotten a license, you know, the, the stars aligned, the heavens opened up, the sun shone down on APTN, and they hired me for some reason to be the first news director and to build a national indigenous television news operation, and we did. And the whole idea of building that was that we had stories that we couldn't tell in the mainstream. We couldn't tell them, and mostly because we had overseers, we had editors and producers who often didn't think that these stories were worth telling or they didn't understand the meaning of these stories, the implications, the importance of these stories to us, to our people, to our communities. And I think that creating that news organization, doing the stories that we do, changing the narrative one story at a time was also an impetus, a push for other journalists of color to begin telling their stories, whether they were other marginalized or racialized communities to start telling those stories take charge of their narrative and change it. 
So I want to thank the Canadian Journalism Foundation again on behalf of all of us. Congratulations to Dan David. Rarely do I trust anyone with two first names, but I will gladly make an exception for you, Dan. David, congratulations. While we use this platform to acknowledge those who have enjoyed lengthy established careers, we also want to recognize those whose careers are just beginning. As they're entering a competitive and rapidly changing industry, we also want to offer encouragement. I can speak from some first-hand experience uh, in my industry that there will be days that will be challenging. My early acting career is chock full of supporting bits and four-second clips of me saying things like, hey Sarge, phone's for you. <laughs> That's actually, I think, from season two of Street Legal, uh, which is on DVD, I think. You, you check it out if you want to see the the whole scene. I come in later and, and, and get coffee in the, uh, in the background. But what is worth? Keep at it. Keep doing the work. Here with two emerging voices who will carry on the work started by Dan David. Once again, Janella. Thanks, Eric. The CJF CBC Indigenous Journalism Fellowships were established to encourage Indigenous voices and foster a better understanding of Indigenous issues. The award allows two early career Indigenous journalists to explore these issues of interest while being hosted for one month by the CBC News Indigenous Unit. Our two recipients are both university grads. University of Toronto graduate Riley Yesno plans to explore the challenges faced by two-spirit and queer Indigenous people in northern and remote communities. Shayla Sayer Brabant, a graduate of the First Nations University of Canada in Regina, will explore two difficult issues that continue to affect Indigenous youth, self-harm and suicide. Let's meet these two new voices. Ani, Bojo, Riley Yesno, Nindijnikaz, Iamatung First Nation, Ndonjaba, Mi'kma'ki, Nintonche. Hi, my name is Riley Yesno. I'm from Iamatung First Nation and currently living in Mi'kma'ki in what is currently known as St. John's, Newfoundland. And I am one of this year's recipients for the CJF CBC Indigenous Journalism Fellowships. I am so grateful for this opportunity, not only to develop my journalistic skills with the incredible team at CBC Indigenous, but because I have this chance to tell the story of queer Indigenous folks living in the North who, like myself, never really saw stories of our voices being represented in the media. This is something I'm so passionate about and cannot wait to pursue this summer. Miigwech for the time, miigwech for the opportunity. And I'm a proud Nahio Two-Spirit from Poundmaker Cree First Nation. I was born and raised in Askanaka, Asustake, what is now known as Regina, Saskatchewan, in the Treaty 4 territory. I wanted to thank my mom and my dad for being my home fire and always believing in me. I wanted to thank Shannon Avison at the Indigenous Communication Arts Program. If you haven't recruited me all those years ago, I would not be here to this day. And I gotta thank Natanis Pipot for encouraging me to apply and just being an amazing role model for myself and other Indigenous storytellers. I want to thank everyone at CBC Indigenous and CJF, all the sponsors for creating opportunities like this where Indigenous voices and stories and other amazing journalists can come together and be recognized for their work and their talent. And I'm very honored to be one of those people. Thanks everyone. Have a great day. Congratulations to Shayla and Riley. Michelle Landsberg got her start in the business as a young journalist in 1962. She'd go on to report on a variety of topics, becoming one of Canada's first journalists to address issues such as sexual harassment in the workplace, racial discrimination in the workplace, and gender equality in matters of divorce. Michelle's a role model to many, given her body of work as an author, social activist, feminist, and a champion of women's equality issues. Named in her honor, the Landsberg Award celebrates a journalist who gives greater profile to women's issues, a journalist who walks in the path that Michelle Landsberg forged. In their adjudication process this year, our jury selected two honorable mentions, Molly Hayes and Jaina Pruden, both from the Globe and Mail. Here to tell us about this year's winner, here's Janella. 
The Landsberg Award carries a $5,000 prize and is presented in association with the Canadian Women's Foundation. For their stories addressing women's experiences of male violence, this year's joint winners of the Landsberg Award are two longtime courts and crime reporters with the Toronto Star. Congratulations to Alicia Hasham and Wendy Gillis. Hi, I'm Wendy. Alicia and I wanted to thank the Canadian Journalism Foundation, the Canadian Women's Foundation, Michelle Landsberg, and members of the jury for this incredibly meaningful award. We can't thank you enough for this honor. It means so much to us. We share this award. We share it with the women, the victims, the families, the experts who have over the years trusted us to tell their stories. Thank you so much for that trust and for your bravery. On a personal note, I wanted to thank my partner, Luke, and the amazing women who have been in my life, in particular, my aunt, Kathy, this is for you. Wendy and I would also like to thank our editors, Doug, Ed, and Irene for their continued encouragement and championing of our reporting. We'd also like to thank the star for continuing to invest time, money, and resources into telling these stories and continuing the incredible legacy of Michelle Landsberg. We are so honored to have won this award. I'm obviously preaching to the choir here, but there's nothing like reading a newspaper or, or a well-written, thoughtful article on a news organization's website to really make you realize the power of words. Not all words, some words are are just dumb, but like like really good words. For a personal example, like, like many of you, during the pandemic, there, there were days where I just felt blah. You know, it's the only word I could I could think of. Those days when you really don't care, when showering even feels so last month. I was feeling that way one day, and and, and I'm reading an article, and this word jumped out at me: languishing. Languishing, right? So much better than, than blah. You know, it's like, it's like, honey, I'm not just sitting around eating ice cream, watching Tiger King for the fourth time because some of his songs are actually pretty good. No, I'm languishing. Thank you, New York Times. Thank you, journalism. While Janella presents our next award, I'll be here. You're right, Eric, words have power, and so do photos. That's what this next award celebrates. The great pictures we're enjoying right now are part of the portfolio of Evan Bueller. Evan Bueller is a photojournalist with the Rocky Mountain Outlook. He's also the 2021 recipient of the Tom Hansen Photojournalism Award. Tom Hansen, the award's namesake, is the Canadian press photographer who captured some of the most defining news and sports images in our country's history. This award allows an early career photojournalist the opportunity for a six-week paid internship with the Canadian Press in Toronto. Congratulations, Evan. It's an honour to be this year's Tom Hansen Photojournalism Award recipient. I'd like to thank the Selection Committee, the Canadian Press and the CJF for seeing my motivation to grow as a photojournalist. I'd also like to thank my friends, family and colleagues for their constant support. This award is a gift for young emerging photojournalists, and I hope to honor Tom's legacy with the same passion and integrity he showed in his work. Thank you. Pop quiz. What do Matt Damon, John Lithgow, Natalie Portman, and Tommy Lee Jones all have in common? Well, for one thing, they were all mean to me at parties. Not mean so much as they uh, didn't invite me. More to the point, they're all acclaimed actors who went to Harvard. They? Actors could be smart. As for this guy, I may not have gone to Harvard, but uh, the school I went to did have a Latin motto that I carry with me to this day. Prudentia Asienta. It's from my high school in, in Scarborough, and I don't, I don't know what it means, but I carry it. To tell us how all of this is connected, once again, Janella. 
The Martin Wise Goodman Canadian Neiman Fellowship is awarded to a mid-career journalist and provides the recipient with the opportunity to take undergraduate and graduate courses at Harvard University for a year of intellectual exploration. The fellowship includes tuition to Harvard and a stipend for living expenses, all funded by the Martin Wise Goodman Trust to the Neiman Foundation for Journalism. Martin Goodman is the late president of the Toronto Star and a member of the Neiman class of 1962. While at Harvard, this year's recipient plans to study how newsrooms and news organizations can adapt to better foster, retain and promote black, indigenous and racialized journalists. All in the hopes of sculpting a media future with more voices and more stories told with new points of view. The winner of this year's fellowship is Toronto-based journalist, writer and producer, Pasant Matar. I can hardly believe this is real. Thank you to the Neiman Foundation, to Harvard, to the Martin Wise Goodman Trust, and of course, to the Goodman family. Lauren, Jonathan, Janice, I never got a chance to meet Martin Goodman, but through getting to know you all over the last few months, I feel like I've gotten a window into who he was. A tenacious journalist who cared deeply about his craft, about Canada, and about his family. I know that his getting to do the Neiman was a dream come true for him. And I want to thank you all for making that same dream come true for me as well. It's no secret that this last year has been a challenging one. And it's one that really made me question and re-examine my role in the industry and whether I have a place in it. And by being selected as this year's Neiman, I can tell you that I've never felt more sure of where I need to be and where I'm headed. I look forward to an amazing year of learning at Harvard to bring back those lessons to Canada after what I know is going to be probably one of the best years of my life. Thank you. Merci. Shukran. The William Southam Journalism Fellowships at Massey College in the University of Toronto provide a valuable opportunity for journalists to broaden their knowledge base and strengthen their skills. Fellows can take courses in a wide range of disciplines such as law, climate science, Indigenous studies, artificial intelligence and media studies. Fellows return to their work reinvigorated and with an expanded vision of themselves as journalists. They also return with a renewed conviction about the enduring need for excellence. It's my pleasure to announce this year's fellows. The St. Clair Balfour Fellow, Montreal-based digital journalist Jonathan Montpetit. The William Southam Journalism Fellow, Toronto-based reporter for the Globe and Mail, Wensi Liang. The William Southam Journalism Fellow, Toronto author and freelance writer, Michael Barkley. The Webster McConnell Fellow, Beirut-based broadcast journalist and writer, Rebecca Collard. The Gordon N. Fisher JHR Fellow will be announced in the summer. Congratulations to everyone. Each year, the CJF Tribute recognizes the careers of exceptional journalists whose work embodies the values of truth and excellence, people that represent the best of this industry. While the two journalists we're honoring this year have traveled different paths in their professional lives, the body of their work has been guided by common objectives, to keep us informed, to keep us safe, and to keep us healthy. In these complex times, the work of these journalists has never been more vital. Let's meet them. Well, if you weren't already following our Canadian tribute before the pandemic, chances are you became familiar with his work as the global pandemic took hold of our lives. He's a multi-award winning reporter and columnist who has long given Canadians the vital context and information that we need to stay healthy and safe. Over his career, he's consistently tackled stories and difficult topics from tainted blood to AIDS and SARS. Most recently, his work led us through the informational maze of COVID-19. His latest book, Neglected No More, The Urgent Need to Improve the Lives of Canada's Elders in the Wake of the Pandemic, was released in March of this year and serves as an example of a journalist who continues to navigate us through complex and uncomfortable subject matter. Without this reporter's resolve and tireless search for the truth, so many stories and injustices would have gone unnoticed. So many would have gone untold. We're proud to honor Andre Picard.
As you heard, I'm not a doctor. I'm a lowly journalist. I tell stories. That's what I've done for a long time. And in my work, I meet many people, from those with acute illnesses like AIDS, through to people who live with rare and even fatal conditions. I have the privilege of listening to and learning from their fears and frustrations, their hopes and dreams, their wisdom and their rage, their intimacies. They're often inspiring. Social isolation is an epidemic in modern society. It's a painful, silent, cruel epidemic. More than one in eight seniors live totally alone, in total isolation. We have to decide uh, that elders matter, that we want people no matter how old they are, uh, how many illnesses they have, we want them in the community. I think we know quite, quite well how it spreads. I think what we don't know is the long-term impact. It's the immunity part of the puzzle that's really a, a big question mark. Every day I get uh, emails and tweets from people saying, hey, but deaths are way down, everything's great. But deaths are a, a lagging indicator. We're gonna know in a month or six weeks if there's a lot more deaths. And we can't just sit on our hands for that time or else it's too late. The next year, 18 months are gonna be hard. I, I think we're gonna figure this out. The humans are very resilient and we're gonna live with this. Andre, it is my honour and pleasure to congratulate you on your Tribute to Journalism Award. At no time has the need for insightful medical journalism been more important in this country and globally than through this COVID-19 pandemic. And you have once again excelled. Your insight, perspective and understanding of the nuance when so many seek absolutes is really what leads you to stand above. That and your commitment and dedication to diving into the issues is so valued and appreciated. It is with honour that I say congratulations on such a well-deserved recognition. Here's to you. Our 2021 Canadian tribute, please welcome Globe and Mail health reporter and columnist, Andre Picard. I want to begin by saying what a great honour it is to receive this tribute from the Canadian Journalism Foundation. An award like this is very humbling. It forces you to do something we rarely do in daily journalism, reflect on the impact of our work. C'est aussi un peu gênant parce que je reconnais qu'il y a beaucoup de super journalistes qui pourraient, et sans doute devraient, être ici à ma place. The COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated how vital journalism is to democracy and to the public's health. It has shone a spotlight on our power to do good and our need to do so much more to repair a fractured society. I've had more than my share of awards and flattery this year to the point where it's a bit overwhelming. Don't let the white beard fool you. I'm not a wise old sage. More than anything else, the quirky things I've been interested in for decades, infectious disease, public health, health equity, risk communication, all of these have suddenly become important and newsworthy. In my 40th year of journalism, I've become an overnight success, not because I've changed, but because the world has. This is the premier event in Canadian journalism. I know there are a lot of industry leaders in the audience. My take home message for you is if you want authoritative voices, if you want quality journalism, Give young people the opportunities I was so privileged to have at the Globe and Mail. Opportunities to learn, to travel, to fail, to get back up again, to specialize, to challenge traditions, to afflict the powerful, to blaze some new trails. Just as importantly, you need to give those opportunities to those who have been long denied them, to young journalists who reflect all the richness of Canada, people of color, indigenous people, people of all genders, all languages and beliefs. The world is changing fast, so our newsrooms must change faster. Notre diversité est notre superpuissance et notre futur. Les honneurs individuels sont un peu trompeurs parce que le journalisme est un sport d'équipe. 
Ce prix ne m'appartient pas uniquement. Il doit être partagé avec tous les collègues, rédacteurs et éditeurs qui m'ont enduré au cours des années. J'aimerais nommer des noms, mais la liste de mes mentors serait beaucoup trop longue et sans doute incomplète. I said a moment ago that being old doesn't make you wise, but it does afford you the luxury of honest self-reflection. So let me tell you a bit about me. I'm not the greatest writer. I don't have the patience for investigative journalism. Partisan politics bores me to tears. I've got a face for radio. I'm wonkish. I'm a data geek. But I'm pithy. I have the ability to make complex issues understandable and digestible to the public. That's my superpower. I inherited this gift from my mother, a Depression-era baby who grew up to be a very frugal mum, one who was convinced that any long-distance call exceeding 30 seconds would bankrupt the nation. To this day, I can't pick up a phone without the words, you don't own Bell Canada, ringing in my ears. We learned to get to the point in my family, and I've made a career of it, 750 words at a time. I found my niche and my passion. Every journalist should be so lucky. The final thing I would say, especially after bragging about my brevity, is that awards like this can sometimes feel a bit funereal. But I want you to know that I'm not done yet. Far from it. I'll be more than happy post-COVID to go back to my relative obscurity as a health columnist. But when the next pandemic comes around, I'll be ready to kick ass again. And hopefully, so too with, will a whole new generation of writers who put my knowledge to shame. That would be the greatest tribute of all. Je vous remercie du fond de mon cœur. Santé. Our international tribute for 2021 is that extremely rare combination of correspondent and neurosurgeon. He's a broadcaster who's been part of our lives for over 20 years. A person who doesn't just talk the talk, he's a passionate person who puts his words into action. He's performed emergency operations while in the field on assignment and has provided medical care to the vulnerable during times of crisis. He's used his platform as a best-selling author and broadcaster to amplify his message of wellness. And he uses these platforms to educate us and help us. His latest book, released in January, is Keep Sharp, Build a Better Brain at Any Age. This year's international tribute is Dr. Sanjay Gupta. His ability to kind of take complex medical information and, you know, figure out a way to, to translate it to me and to our viewers is incredible. Let's bring in our chief medical correspondent, Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Dr. Sanjay Gupta is out front. Seen as chief medical correspondent, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, look for some answers. He epitomizes clear communication and fair reporting. He translates and contextualizes complicated science, medical and health related issues, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, in a way that the public can easily understand. PCR amplifies the amount of genetic material in the sample, making it much easier for scientists to spot the genetic material of something like the novel coronavirus. He will tell you what he knows, he will take you on the journey along with him, and he will also tell you what we still don't know. And I think that's part of the reason why he connects so well with viewers. Studies designed to find benefit were not getting funded. Researchers could not conduct those studies. It was preordained as a substance that has no medicinal value. That's when I started to say, well, what's going on here? I'm just always amazed at his willingness to kind of dive in and roll up his sleeves in order to, to not only get the story, but also to help people. Just to give you an idea of how busy things can get here in the middle of Haiti, uh, a three-year-old boy over here who's in a motorcycle accident, and also over here a 61-year-old man who has a large hemorrhage in his brain, he's also going to need surgery. Both those operations need to happen within the next hour or so. His heart is in every story that he does, which is why he is so trustworthy as a journalist. What they basically concluded was that there was an association, a 19% increased risk of developing cancer for fire workers who were first responders who worked on the pile at 9-11. Sanjay connects with an audience because he's, he's not just a, a great doctor and a, a great reporter, um, he's a decent human being. 
As someone who has worked very closely with Dr. Sanjay Gupta for 20 years here at CNN, I can testify that he's a world-class journalist, not just a world-class neurosurgeon. He is simply an outstanding physician surgeon, a man steeped in science, fact, and evidence, and he has extrapolated that persona onto his other identity, that of a medical journalist, where without exaggerating or downplaying the facts, he uses his highly honed skills of clarity, accuracy, balance, and empathy to be one of the most trusted medical correspondents in the world. Congratulations, Sanjay, on this well-deserved award. Sanjay, thank you very much for all this information. Yeah, thank you. He is an author, an associate professor, a neurosurgeon, and CNN's chief medical correspondent. More than that, he's a face we trust and a voice we appreciate. Please welcome Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Eric, thank you uh, so much for presenting this award to me. I really wish that I could be there in person. What a treat it would have been to meet you and to meet all of you at CJF, uh, the Canadian Journalism Foundation. Look at this, this award. I mean, this is just absolutely beautiful and it's gonna have a place of great prominence and pride in our household for sure. This award really, it means a lot to me. It really does. I don't think we get a chance very often, especially when you're in the middle of a a big news story that's been going on for 14 months now to just uh, stop and reflect a bit and, and be thankful for colleagues like the ones that I have in the world of journalism. And, and, um, and this, this award, you should just know, means, means so much to me for what it is, but also what it kind of forced me to do, to just stop and slow down and, and reflect a little bit. So thank you very much for that. You know, I, I'm a doctor and came to journalism a little bit later in my life. I, I was not formally trained as a journalist. But long before I joined your ranks, I just had tremendous respect for journalists. I, I, I just felt like they occupied such an important part in our society and they, they still do that. They, they occupy this really important role. And I think for me personally, having done this now for 20 years and covered this story of the pandemic, this, this pandemic for the last 14 months, th there's things that become even more apparent to me and clearer to me. One is that, you know, in each society, we do need people who are sort of the, the honest brokers, if you will. People who can give you information and make that information actually transformed into knowledge that you can use in your life. And those people have to be people who you, you trust, people who are free of conflict, who serve only one purpose, which is to further the discussion, advance knowledge, and make sure the public is informed. Journalists stand in service to the public, and never has that been more important than right now. And I think the idea of being an honest broker who just wants to make sure I do my homework and I can provide the best knowledge to you that hopefully can improve your life, I think is really, really, uh, it's a really worthy goal. It may be the most important sort of work that I've ever done, and I take it very, very seriously. I also take it with a lot of humility. I think sometimes people think science is like math. You have all the answers, and you know, you, you, you gotta say it as it is, and nothing can ever change. And what you realize is that many times science can be more like art. It grows and evolves and it changes and somebody has to be open-minded to continue to look for new, new knowledge, new facts, new data to make sure that you're giving a complete picture. And that's what we have to do as well. We have to understand that even if we give objective data, we say something is 0.5% lethal, we have to then take the next step and contextualize what that means for somebody. What does that mean, 0.5% lethal? How is that going to change your life? What are you gonna do with this knowledge? That's, that's the extra work. Um, and it, 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 like I said, it's a really worthy, worthy goal to do that extra work, to take that extra time, that extra beat, to make sure the knowledge you are transmitting is of value to the audience. I, this past year, uh, again, has been one of the most challenging years of my life. I don't think I've ever worked harder. I, and I'm talking about my chief surgical year of residency as well, 
which is always the busiest year of life, but this year has just been very, very constant. Um, but, I, but I've really come to, to appreciate the value, again, uh, of this sort of work and think it's important um, in ways that I hadn't even considered. I also was reminded that you always want to talk about and, and present the, the data and the evidence and the facts, and that's obviously the most important thing. But there is, a, there is an inflection point um, between the transparent honesty of the data and the hope that you can provide as well. I have often thought this past year of Maya Angelou's great quote where she said something like, people may not always remember what you said, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. So sometimes continuing to, to make sure that you really show that empathy, feel that empathy, and display it even when the news isn't always good. It's something that I live by. Um, maybe it's part of the reason I'm getting this award, I don't know, but I will treasure this, I will cherish it, and CJF, I can't thank you enough. If you'd like to hear more from these honorees, the CJF will be offering a special presentation tomorrow at 1 Eastern. Last year's tribute, Anna Maria Tremonti, who's best known for her remarkable CBC broadcast career covering conflict zones and current events, will host back-to-back -back conversations with Andre Picard and Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Discussions will range from the topics of each of their new books to the challenges of covering COVID-19 and everything in between. You can sign up to watch that free virtual event by visiting the CJF website. While a day like today is a celebration and recognition of the current and next generations of journalists, it's also important that we pay tribute to those from our journalism community we've lost since the last time we gathered. People whose contributions to our industry won't be forgotten. To help us honor our colleagues and friends that we've lost, she's the host of CBC Music's Saturday Night Jazz and an award-winning singer, songwriter, and pianist, gracing us with the magic of her music. Her latest album is Out of Dust. Please welcome Lila Bialy. Hi, I'm Lila Bialy, and I'm so honored to be offering a song for the In Memoriam segment of the Canadian Journalism Foundation Awards. I was actually going to repurpose a song I had already written, but then I was thinking about the role of journalists in this world, the critical role you've all had, especially during pandemic times and in the age of fake news, I felt compelled to write something new. It's called Front Lines. You were working on the front lines, bringing us the daily headlines. You were working till the sunrise, every night and every day. You were working on the front lines, looking for the place where truth lies, even when they said it ain't wise. That's a risk you'd always take You started off with a high school dream The smell of ink on paper and a printing machine You knew how to break a story, tell us how it went You byline on the back page and the line from your pen and then begin again And then begin again You left your home Left your comforts behind Lived out of a suitcase For the leads you might find Driven by the love of country It's the life you choose You were risking everything Selfless pursuit And then begin again And then begin You were working on the front lines You were always under deadlines You were working to the sunrise Every night and every day You were working on the front lines Searching for the place the truth lies even when they said it ain't wise That's a risk you'd always take
working on the front lines You were working till the sunrise Moving on before the ink dries And then begin again And then begin again The work begins again Thank you, Lala. Those faces and the passion they brought to the journalism community will be missed. In this new world of the global pandemic, we've all had to wade through an unprecedented amount of information in search of actual facts. In the world of journalism, one of the things we've been reminded of is that the impact of false news is very real. We needn't look any further than the events of January 6th to see that misinformation can not only threaten the very foundations of democracy, it can also be lethal. Combating misinformation and educating Canadians about real news, facts, and truth is at the core of the mission of the Canadian Journalism Foundation. To tell us more about this mandate and the vital work that happens year round, please welcome the President and Executive Director of the CJF, Natalie Turby. Tonight, the Canadian Journalism Foundation is proud to celebrate the extraordinary journalists and news organizations that we call the Champions of Truth. Ce soir, la FGC est fière de célébrer les journalistes et les organisations médiatiques extraordinaires que nous appelons les Champions de la Vérité. In these complicated times, the fight for facts and the war against misinformation has never been more important. The CJF is proud to be an engine in the ongoing search for truth. A recent study conducted jointly by the CJF and Polara found an encouraging link between accurate journalism and better health decisions. Specific to our times, Canadians who say they trust media and journalists are more informed about the risks and benefits of COVID-19 vaccines and are more likely to get the vaccine when it's available. With the increased trust in news, Canadians have also become more aware of misinformation and are continuing to seek out credible sources. This means that the dial is moving and the message that we are all championing together is being heard. While tonight's awards are a marquee event on the CJF calendar, it is certainly not our only event. Our monthly J Talks feature luminaries from the journalism world to spirited discussions that shine a light on the essential role that journalism plays in our democracy. Our ongoing fellowships create opportunities and encouragement for the generation of journalists who will guide us through the next decades. And we would like to invite each of you to join us on September 28th for World News Day. World News Day is the day we bring more than 300 news organizations together to draw global public attention to the role that journalists play in providing trustworthy news and information. None of what we do can happen without our many sponsors, organizations that are vital to the work we do year round in supporting fact-based journalism. Thank you once again to tonight's presenting sponsor, Scotiabank. Thank you to the generous support of Labatt, Medtronic, and Accenture. Thank you to our champions of diversity and our champions of truth. Coca-Cola Canada, CBC Radio Canada, CTV News, Uber, Microsoft, Rogers, Thomson Reuters, Facebook Journalism Project, Lululemon, Aritzia, BMO Financial Group, Intact, General Motors of Canada, Sobeys, and CIBC. Thank you to our many table sponsors. We could not do this without you. Merci pour votre soutien continu. And our gratitude to our many in-kind and media sponsors. Thank you for your generous support of our work. To our hosts, Janella Massa and Eric McCormack, our warmest thanks. In your careers, you have both been trailblazers. Thank you for bringing your light and your joy to our annual celebration of journalism. Et merci à vous tous et toutes d'avoir participé à la cérémonie virtuelle de la remise des prix de la FGC de cette année. Stay well, and we look forward to raising a glass to journalism when we can meet again. And now for our final award of the evening, 
back to Janella and Eric. I must say I'm enjoying this show. I mean, obviously I'm enjoying hearing from the very intelligent and, and passionate honorees and enjoying my part in, in celebrating their achievements. But to be honest, I'm also grateful just for a, a reason to dress up. <laughs> like most of us in these languishing times of COVID-19. Well, let's just say my family's gotten very familiar with my mustard yellow shorts and my Alice Cooper goes to hell t-shirt. So it's great to be part of a, a more formal evening where I can present myself with a little dignity. Up top. I'm still wearing the, the mustard yellow shorts. In a year where COVID-19 dominated the news and our lives, the submissions for the 2021 Jackman Award for Excellence in Journalism in the large media category shed light on a variety of critical issues that required public attention and public response. Each submission embodied the ideals of journalistic excellence, including originality, accuracy, and accountability. Once again, we're thrilled to be joined by members of each of these nominated organizations. CTV News Calgary is nominated for The Spread of Racism, a documentary exploring anti-Asian racism and discrimination during the pandemic. From CTV News Calgary, please welcome anchor and video journalist Kathy Lee. Thank you so much, Janella. I want to start off by saying thank you to the Canadian Journalism Foundation and, of course, to the jury. Uh, to be a finalist for the CJF Jackman Award for Excellence in Journalism is truly an honour. And to be in this category for our documentary, COVID-19, The Spread of Racism, is even more special. Asian people are still being racially attacked and discriminated against during the pandemic. After our piece aired, the number one comment that we received from those outside the Asian community was, we had no idea that this was even happening. And I'm proud that we could shed light on this disturbing issue in hopes of bringing more understanding to the public and hopefully bring about change. I want to thank the leaders at CTV Calgary for believing in this project. And I want to thank my wonderful colleagues who worked so hard and were so passionate about bringing this story to life. Thank you. The Globe and Mail is nominated for its series, investigating why Ottawa and the public health agency were unable to respond effectively to the COVID-19 crisis. From the Globe and Mail, investigative reporter Grant Robertson. Thank you. Um, I want to thank the Canadian Journalism Foundation um, for, for recognizing us and, and all the other reporters this year. It was a remarkable year for journalism in Canada, I think. Um, our, our investigation began with a simple question, um, why wasn't Canada better prepared for this? We were the country that had SARS, and we saw people die when uh, an emergency couldn't be contained. And we spent years preparing for something like this. And so we began with that question, and um, when we dug into it, we found that pandemic preparedness plans hadn't been followed. And as we pulled back the layers of that, what we eventually found was the problems in, inside the public health agency had been festering for close to a decade, and we really weren't prepared uh, to take this on. And people inside the department said, there are problems Canadians don't even realize happened, like the shutdown of our pandemic early alert system, our warning system was shut down less than a year before. And when we found that out, it led us to a number of other problems, such as the lack of uh, scientists inside the department and lack of support for scientists, which we didn't expect. And um, if you look at the root cause of this pandemic, the emergency stockpile not being prepared, the lack of risk assessments being effective, the uh, lack of quarantine measures and airport measures, it all comes back to this problem. And uh, we're honored to be here tonight um, uh, on behalf of myself and my editors and the entire Global Mail. Um, uh, we're honored to be honored. The Montreal Gazette is nominated for exposing the horrific details at a Dorval nursing home where residents were abandoned during the pandemic. Please welcome Montreal Gazette reporter Aaron Durfell. For more than two decades, uh, there have been reports after reports um, underscoring the horrific conditions in uh, nursing homes. Um, unfortunately, it took a pandemic to really bring this to, uh, to light. And the Montreal Gazette was one of the first news organizations early in the pandemic to expose the uh, horrific conditions of neglect uh, among the elderly. In this relatively small nursing home, there were uh, more than 30 residents who died in a short period, 
three weeks um, uh, dehydrated, malnourished, um, you know, soiled in, in their feces. And as a result um, of uh, a series of stories, uh, two uh, big ones, um, we were fortunate this rarely ha happens uh, that uh, that the impact of, of a news organization, uh, what we do is um, occurs so swiftly, but the very next day after, our for, uh, after the Montreal Gazette's first story ran, the premier of uh, Quebec, Francois Legault, he ordered uh, the immediate inspection of 40 um, uh, private nursing homes in the province. Ultimately, um, the government hired uh, nearly 8,000 uh, patient attendants to work uh, in long-term care. I would like to um, to thank the efforts of of, uh, of our team because this is a team effort. Lucinda Chodin, the editor in chief, um, Enza Micheletti, and uh, Monique Baudin, uh, who are um, the assistant city editors. Our chief photographer, John Mahoney, myself, uh, I was involved. Uh, my name's Aaron. Um, so uh, it really is an honor, and um, thank you very much. The Toronto Star with the Investigative Journalism Bureau, part of the Dalalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto, is nominated for Generational Distress, a cross-border collaboration on the mental health crisis undermining a generation of young people. Here's investigative reporter at the Toronto Star and director of the Investigative Journalism Bureau, Robert Cripp. Thanks so much. Great to be here. I'm just happy to be in the same virtual room with all these uh, remarkable finalists. Um, this series was a fascinating collaboration, and I think Mark, a number of firsts. First of all, it's the, it's the inaugural project of the Investigative Journalism Bureau, which you may not know of as a newly minted Canadian nonprofit center based at the U of T. And then together with the Toronto Star, the series brought to life a very unique model, I think, that ultimately involved more than 80 reporters, and academics, researchers, and student journalists in 10 universities across two countries exploring an emerging public health crisis. And there were some tremendous moments of real magic where young reporters from Stanford University to King's College were bringing their valuable perspective, partnering with senior journalists and editors at the Toronto Star, including David Bruiser and Jesse McLean, who brought real ambition and scale and gravitas to this. The real heroes, no question, are the are the young people and, and their families who spoke to us often wrenchingly about the lives and too often the deaths of so many young people facing debilitating mental health challenges today. We're tremendously in their debt and grateful to the CJF judges for helping to amplify those voices. Thanks for doing it. Winnipeg Free Press is our final nominee for A Stain on Our Game, an investigative series on the life and destructive legacy of a disgraced junior hockey coach representing Winnipeg Free Press. Please welcome Paul Simon. In our case, what we were trying to do in the midst of uh, COVID coverage was get at a story I think that was had never really been fully told, even though newsrooms everywhere had talked about what Graham James had done, his his crimes, his trials, and his, his sentences. And what we really wanted to do was to dig deeper into the scandal surrounding Graham James. And, and that's what we were able to do uh, in this special investigative uh, project, um, where we got at a level of accountability that had never been there. And, and to explain how it was that one man was able to do what he had done for so long in many cases in plain view and, and why people looked uh, the other way. So Jeff Hamilton, our sports writer, tasked with this rather tall order, uh, his outstanding journalism explained the roots of the criminal behavior of Green James and, and painted a picture of complicity or at very least willful ignorance through all levels of the sport, which allowed James to abuse young players uh, for years. I want to thank Jeff Hamilton for his relentless commitment to this project and for Associate Editor Scott, Ebb Scott Gibbons for overseeing it. But more importantly, I want to thank all those who are his victims for trusting us to tell their story and to give voices to the suffering they still endure. Uh, my hope with this project and with the public service journalism that is so important today more than ever is that we can make change and ensure that there is accountability and that, that no one else chasing their hockey dream ever has to deal with another Graham James.
Congratulations to each of our nominees for what the jury called a brilliantly detailed account of how the Canadian alert system failed on the eve of the COVID-19 pandemic. The winner is The Globe and Mail. Congratulations. This concludes the 2021 edition of the Canadian Journalism Foundation Awards. I hope one day Janella and I can do this in the same room and I look forward to the next time we can all gather to celebrate in person. Congratulations to each of this year's winners and to each of its nominees. Thank you for your commitment to excellence and for your unrelenting pursuit of the truth. From wherever you're watching, even if you're wearing mustard yellow shorts and an Alice Cooper t-shirt, particularly if you're wearing an Alice Cooper t-shirt, thank you for joining us. Thank you for believing in the power and the importance of journalism. As Natalie mentioned, you can visit the Canadian Journalism Foundation website to find out ways that you can get involved or to support its work. Thank you to the wonderful Janella Massa, and I've always wanted to do this. For the CJF, I'm Eric McCormack. Good night. <laughs> Journalism's fun. I really am wearing the shorts. <laughs>